Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Matthew Spaulding. I'm Associate Vice President and Dean for Hillsdale College here in Washington, D.C. Welcome to the Alan P. Kirby Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship. Uh, for those of you who have been keeping score lately, there are a number of important tallies yesterday, mostly predictable. Uh, fortunately, the Nats held on to their series 4-1. The Redskins predictably lost to the Seahawks 21-17 and marriage lost in the Supreme Court by at least six to three, uh, in which they voted to deny cert to several cases coming up in five states based on a previous very confusing decision last year by this court that will probably play out in six more states in which they tacitly endorsed a new definition of marriage. Never before have so many been so confused by so few. And so we blithely go on in this new, brave new world. It's times like this when it's very important that we look back to our roots, recur to the first principles of politics, but also humanity. Recall that broad sweep of freedom, the flourishing of human freedom, the blessings of liberty, as it says in our Constitution, the union of virtue and happiness that exists in the very economy and course of nature as Washington said in his first inaugural. And to give you a sense of this grand sweep, to recall those ideas, I can think of no better person than today's speaker, a good friend of mine. Uh, as is our tradition here at Hillsdale College, uh, he will be introduced by a current student, Christy Berg. She is a junior from Shelby Township, Michigan. Uh, she's a history major at Hillsdale College uh, she is currently here in Washington, D.C. with the Washington Hillsdale Internship Program and interning for the World War I Centennial Commission. Christy. Thank you, Dr. Spalding. It is an honor to be introducing our guest speaker today. The author of several books, including The New Road to Serfdom and Inventing Freedom, how the English-speaking peoples made the modern world, Daniel Hannon studied modern history at Marlborough College and Oriel College, Oxford. First elected to the European Parliament in 1999, he represents Southeast England as a member of the Conservative Party. Additionally, he serves as the Secretary General of the Alliance of European Conservatives and Reformists. Mr. Hannon contributes frequently to several newspapers, including the Wall Street Journal and the Daily Telegraph. He is perhaps most famous for his speech before Parliament, where he called former Prime Minister Gordon Brown the, quote, devalued Prime Minister of a devalued government. If you haven't seen the clip, I recommend watching it on YouTube. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Daniel Hannon. Well, thank you very much for your kind words. Thank you for having me here in this beautiful room, in this wonderful facility. Hillsdale is such a success story. The way in which it's developed this ex massive foothold here in the capital, uh, an academic institution that's become such a powerful part of the national conversation, and a function that is reflected in our glorious surroundings. I was talking to Matthew, who is an old friend of mine, about the room that we're in and his intention of making it a room that would be beautiful rather than just a room that looked like a lecture theater. Beauty is truth, truth, beauty, says the poet Keats. And how very true. In fact, you know, I think this is true really uh, in large part of this city. It's much nicer in practice than in theory. Before you come to Washington, D.C., it's a sort of shorthand, isn't it, for all the things we don't like. Big, remote, unaccountable government that's become cut off from the people it's supposed to serve. And yet, if you worked where I work, in the European Parliament in Brussels, you would come here and you would breathe a deep sigh of satisfaction at the classicism, at the human scale, at the harmonious proportion. This was, uh, again, beauty is truth, truth beauty. The, there are fine buildings here that were built to express a, a glorious and transcendent truth about the relationship between government and people. 
And one of my favorite buildings is the National Archives. And of course, it contains next to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, whose signing we see represented on the picture over there, it contains a copy of Magna Carta. And I wanted to talk a little bit because of the coming anniversary, the uh, 800th centenary of the Great Charter comes in June. Maybe the way of uh, beginning, recalling the importance of that document is to take you back not 800 years, but to August 1647. London was a tense and frightened city. The English Civil War had just ended in victory, thank heaven, for supporters of parliamentary supremacy over supporters of royal absolutism. But it was already becoming clear that the real power in the land rested with the Puritan troopers of the New Model Army, who were advancing on the capital angry and unpaid. And in a gesture of conciliation to the soldiery, Parliament appointed their commander, Sir Thomas Fairfax, as constable of the Tower of London. And the first act of the great Roundhead General on taking up that office was an encouraging one. He called for the greatest treasure in the tower to be brought before him. Not a crown or a scepter or a casket of gems, but an old desiccated parchment covered with spidery and barely legible Latin script. And as he lifted the copy of Magna Carta, Fairfax breathed reverentially this is that we have fought for, and by God's help, we must maintain. Now, why am I coming all the way to Washington, D.C. to talk about this 800-year-old charter? Well, part of the reason is that, curiously, it's always, I think, mattered rather more on this side of the Atlantic than in the place where it was sealed. The act of sealing... Uh, took place in my own electoral district on the riverbank at Runnymede. And the place where that extraordinary event, that, that event of planetary significance took place, went completely unmarked until 1957 when a memorial stone was finally raised there by the American Bar Association remains to this day the only monument to the birthplace of freedom. I, I'm actually working on getting another monument uh, raised there uh, by June of next year. And if anybody would like to be involved with that, please come uh, and talk to me afterwards. They say the definition of chutzpah is, you know, uh, pleading uh, for uh, mercy as an often uh, after you've been found guilty of parasite, but actually the real definition of just for us to come to it and, and then plug a different cause. But I think it's so in keeping with, uh, with the values of Hillsdale and particularly those of Dr. Spaulding, who's written all these wonderful books, that uh, it's okay to mention it here. Uh, you know, there, there was a, a lovely episode two years ago when uh, the Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron, was here, or he was in New York, and he was being interviewed uh, on The Letterman Show. And he was asked, what does Magna Carta mean? Literally, what do the words mean? And he didn't know. Or at least he pretended that he didn't know. I suspect he did know, really. David Cameron was at the most prestigious private school uh, in the UK for five years, doing compulsory Latin. I find it hard to believe that he did. Well, actually, that said, Winston Churchill did once famously translate a piece of Latin in the House of Commons into English, as he put it, for the benefit of any Etonians who might be present. So maybe <laughs> David Cameron himself, an old Etonian, would have been uh, in But I, I kind of think, I mean, magna, right, it's, it's, the, it's, the, first, uh, it's the first to clench an adjective and Carter coming. You, you can infer that one from context, can't you? I, my, my private theory about this is that David Cameron was humming, hamming up the, the role of a kind of Hugh Grant British Prime Minister, the kind of, you know, hapless. We, we like to think that you like that sort of thing. But, <laughs> Whether or, or not that was the case, the fascinating thing is, of course, his audience did have far greater familiarity with the precepts and principles of the Charter than a, a British audience would have had. Because the, uh, this continent began to be seeded from the old world when the mania for Magna Carta was at its height. 
during the, the 17th century when uh, this, uh, it was seen as the ultimate guarantor of, of freedom. It's been cited more than 100 times by your Supreme Court. Uh, your, uh, the, in, the, in the 1930s, the great uh, opponent of Roosevelt's New Deal, the Texan jurist Hatton Sumner, speaking to a, a group of lawyers referring to the, uh, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution said, a straight road runs from Runnymede to Philadelphia. He said, we didn't inherit our rights, we won them on the battlefield. They're a, a, a part of the collective American folk right. What was so special about it? I mean, you, you know, there is an awful lot of cynicism. Even now, it was a, a deal made by a cornered king and his mutinous nobles. Why, 800 years on, am I coming uh, over to Washington, D.C. to talk about it? Well, you know, there is, a, there is a copy of the charter now, I think, in New York. It's just left Boston. It's doing a tour. And I can tell you that the crowds uh, coming to see it don't need convincing. There are four original copies of Magna Carta, contemporaneous ones that were sealed at the field in Runnymede. Two of them are in cathedrals, one at Lincoln and one at Salisbury, tended like the relics that were removed at the time of the Reformation. The other two are in the British Library. Do you know what? You can go and look at them and there isn't a particular fuss. There's no line to get in. There's no uh, security. I, I took my children right up to the ones, uh, the one at Lincoln Cathedral, one sleepy old guide, no big deal. When that same copy was exhibited in New York at the World Exhibition in 1939, an almost unbelievable 14 and a half million people crushed in to see it. The war broke out while it was still on display. And it was transferred to Fort Knox for safekeeping until the victory. The aptest imaginable symbol of what the English-speaking peoples were fighting for. Namely, a system that elevates the individual above the state rather than the reverse. A system that elevates the law above the executive rather than the reverse. And here's the extraordinary thing, 800 years on, because we are so familiar with that concept, the idea of the rule of law, of legal supremacy, we no longer can imagine without a great wrench of our minds what a radical idea it must have seemed when it was first put forward. <laughs> this extraordinary, anomalous, beautiful idea that above the government was something bigger above the king, above the holy scriptures, there was something invisible, something intangible, inaudible, but more powerful than any of us. Something that bound the king as surely as it bound his meanest subject, and that something was the law. The American Bar Association uh, monument has on the pillar the sparest purest, simplest words, and they say it all, to commemorate Magna Carta, symbol of freedom under law. What an extraordinary thing, and it didn't happen anywhere else. And that charter, that ideal that the law was above the state, that the government doesn't get to change the rules as it goes along, that imminent in the people is this folk right, this inheritance of legal supremacy. That contained the seeds, contained the germs of all the freedoms that we now take for granted. Regular elections and uncensored newspapers and habeas corpus, equality between men and women, jury trials, all of these things were contained in embryonic form in the ideal of the rule of law. The easiest thing is to become blasé about the familiar to take for granted the ideals with which we've grown up. The heresy of our age is to think that everyone is going to get there eventually. You know that when any country becomes wealthy enough and educated enough, it will stumble upon the same liberal democratic model. But I have to tell you, my friends, history tells us a very different story. All those ideals were overwhelmingly developed 
in the language in which you are listening to these words. And although they had their birth on that riverbank in my constituency 800 years ago, they reached their highest and most sublime form in the old courthouse in Philadelphia. That is our shared heritage. That's the patrimony that all of us have as citizens of common law, English-speaking countries, wherever our grandparents were born. That's the link that binds us together. To see how exceptional it is, to see how unusual, imagine that any of the great global conflagrations of the last hundred years had ended differently. Imagine that the First or Second World Wars, or that the Cold War, had gone the other way. Would we then be talking about these things as universal human rights, or even Western values? If we're brutally honest, they became universal values because of a series of military victories by the English-speaking peoples. Had our fathers, yours and mine, not been prepared to deploy proportionate force in defense of those values, the world would be a very different looking place today. Take you back to a different August, August 1941, the day that, that Franklin D. Roosevelt made the longest walk of his presidency. Up until then, in a way that is literally unimaginable today, the media had contrived to hide the fact of the president's polio from the electorate. Photographs always showed FDR seated or standing unaided. But on that occasion, invited by Winston Churchill to join him on the decks of HMS Prince of Wales uh, off Newfoundland, FDR was determined literally to rise to the occasion. To the horror of his advisors, who were worried that the deck would buck and that the president would be left in an undignified heap. The band struck up the Stars and Stripes Forever, and Roosevelt, leaning heavily on his cane, supported on one side by his son, supported on the other by a naval officer, made his slow way across the decks. And what happened next was the most extraordinary demonstration of what bound the great English-speaking powers together. It happened to be a Sunday morning, and the crews of the two vessels were paraded for a joint religious service. The sailors from the USS Augusta, which had carried Roosevelt, and those of HMS Prince of Wales. Churchill had planned every detail personally and meticulously, down to the hymns, down to the reading that the chaplain gave from the pulpit. It came from Joshua 1. As I was with Moses, so will I be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage. And afterwards, exultantly, Churchill burst out to an aid the same language, the same hymns, the same ideals. And here's the thing. When he said the same ideals, he wasn't making some bland generalization that we were the good guys. Think of the world as it stood in August 1941. Where else did you find freedom under the law as that Inscription on the Magna Carta Memorial puts it, outside the community of free English-speaking nations, the Anglosphere. The whole of the Eurasian landmass, from Seoul and Vladivostok to Brest and Lisbon, was under one form or another of dictatorship. And you didn't even have the consolation of thinking that it was that way because of a series of military conquests by fascist or communist governments. right? Yes, there were some countries where parliamentary rule had been overthrown by invading soldiers, but there was a much longer list of countries which hadn't needed to be invaded in order to turn to authoritarianism on their own. It was seen in the 30s as the coming thing. Listen to the way the fascists and communists used to speak about our system of values. Look at the adjectives they always appended to it. It was rotten Anglo-Saxon capitalism. It was decadent Anglo-American liberalism, right? The idea was that it was bound to be on its way out because how could a system that elevated the individual, that elevated privacy and property, possibly defeat one 
which elevated martial glory and collective endeavor and the sacrifice of the individual to the many. It stood to reason that state-run militaristic systems must be more powerful than ours. Of course, as we know, thank God that wasn't how it worked out. Anglosphere freedom became the dominant force of the post-war era. And although few countries exactly lived up to it, they all had to at least go along with the outward forms, go even to the nastiest dictatorship today, and you will generally find something called a congress, whose nervous delegates fingering their collars form themselves into things called political parties, trying to anticipate the wishes of the despot. In even the most ugly autocracies, you will generally find something called a Supreme Court, which on paper is not just an expression of the will of the tyrant. Now, we've won, in that sense, the overall battle. Everyone has to pay lip service to it. But we're a very long way away from actualizing our ideals. Get back. I, I, uh, Matthew's very kind in asking me to talk about how it was that these things came about, uh, uh, which I've, I've written a book about. And it was really based on his book, um, We Still Hold These Truths. I'm going to give you a very short version because it was a, a really fascinating question. How is it that these things that we now take for granted, these freedoms, uh, this legal norm, came about in one language among one people and then succeeded against all the odds? And I, when I was writing the book, I thought, I'll approach this like an anthropologist. Go back to the time when what we now recognize as Anglosphere exceptionalism was becoming generalized through the English-speaking world, when the values of personal freedom uh, and individualism were becoming recognized, and when, indeed, the English-speaking world was beginning its takeoff from the end of the 17th century, particularly in the 18th and early 19th centuries. What struck foreign visitors as unusual about English-speaking societies? Maybe there's a clue there. And there were lots of them. All of you know that Tocqueville wrote books about American democracy. It's much less well known that he also wrote books about British democracy. He was married to an English woman. He spent a lot of time uh, in the UK. And although Tocqueville is widely quoted, especially at conservative audiences like this, he is evidently not so widely read, because although he's quoted as the supreme witness to American exceptionalism, he makes very plain on page one of democracy in America that he sees the English-speaking world as a political continuum. He talks about how in the new world the characteristics of the old world countries were exaggerated. So Spanish America, as he saw it, exaggerated the ramshackle corruption of Philip's Spain. French America, the uh, obscurantist seigneurialism of Louis France. But English America, as he always called it, that he believed took further the what we would now call libertarian, the individualist philosophy of the mother country. He had a lovely phrase. He said, the American is the Englishman left to himself. And he then went on to write about how much wider the channel was than the Atlantic in terms of culture. He was one such visitor, you know, Montesquieu visited and, and Voltaire and then many, many more who were uh, less well known but who kept travel journals, who wrote letters home. What struck them as peculiar, as unique about English speaking society? Well, there are lots of things. They found us a very undeferential people, especially those who traveled as aristocrats. They were uh, upset not to be given what they thought was their due in terms of respect. They found us, uh, related to it, a, a very materialistic people. They were often very rude about this. They found us very money-grubbing, very lacking in higher uh, spiritual values. There were three things that I think really did jump out, and almost all of them recognized these as being uh, particularisms of the English-speaking world. The first and this was really extraordinary in its time, is religious pluralism. Not just religious toleration. That existed in lots of places. Right? The, the Ottoman Empire had religious toleration. But the freedom for every sect to proselytize. 
a market among different congregations. That was absolutely unique. It, of course, happened here first. It was uh, something that came right from the moment of the foundation of the Republic, but it had become generalized throughout the English-speaking world. The last uh, emancipations, or the, the final uh, lifting of the last few uh, relatively mild restrictions on non-Anglicans were lifted in the 1830s, while the Spanish Inquisition was still in force. I mean, it, it, was, a, it was a quite uh, extraordinary thing. And what this meant is that you could be a free thinker without being against the system. French Catholic writers particularly were uh, uh, fascinated by this. And they, they said it, it creates a culture which then becomes separate from what church you go to. So Tocqueville, again, had chapters about how Catholics in the English-speaking world were very libertarian and Protestants in, the, in France were much more statist. He said it, it isn't to do with the teachings of the church, it's to do with the culture in which the congregations can compete. The second thing, which they all notice, in fact, you notice it much more as a, as a traveler than as a, a native, you can't really reach Anglosphere countries except over water. With the partial exception, I'll come back to this in a second, with the partial exception of North America, the Anglosphere is an extended archipelago. Great Britain, Ireland, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Singapore. It is true that North America is a continent, but geopolitically it is the most isolated, or was the most isolated of all. Look at uh, Jefferson's inaugural address, kindly separated by an ocean from the exterminating havoc of one quarter of the globe. This was the mentality of an island people who didn't need continental embroilments. Or listen to uh, the words of Washington's farewell address, still reverentially read out in the Senate. Why does that matter? Islands don't need a standing army in peacetime. Defense is the business of the Navy or of a territorial militia, and neither a Navy nor a militia can be used as an instrument of internal repression. So when the government wants something from the population, it has to ask nicely by summoning people's representatives in a parliament and dealing with them as taxpayers. Hugely significant. Adam Smith, a brilliant economist, was brought up in Scotland shortly after the Act of Union, and he dated the takeoff of Great Britain to the dismantling of the last land frontier in the 18th century. He said, from, from this moment, Great Britain was an island nation, no soldiers, no vehicle for royal repression. Maybe there's something in that. But then this is the really big one, and this is the one that struck all of these visitors as the most anomalous, the most inexplicable of all, and that is the beautiful system that we call common law, which again is very, very remarkable. I mean, you'd expect if you were designing a legal system, right, you would expect the system to be the way the rest of the world operates, the way the civil Roman law systems have, where you write a law down and then you apply it to a particular case. Right? Stands to reason, doesn't it? How extraordinary, and again, we are blasé about the familiar, how extraordinary to have a legal system where nobody wrote it down, where the legal corpus grew up case by case, like a coral, with the judgment of each case serving as the starting point of the next one, so that instead of being an instrument of government control, the legal system was open to the individual seeking redress. There was an assumption of residual rights. It was taken as read that if something were not expressly prohibited, it was allowed. Very, very different political climate that that creates. Believe me, if you worked where I worked, you would see this every day. The starting point for most of my colleagues in the European Parliament, whenever I say, why do we need a, an EU directive on this, is to say, but, but it's unregulated. You know? <laughs> and in the, in the continental mindset, unregulated is synonymous with illegal. The idea that that is the natural state of affairs, that if there was no problem, you didn't need a solution, that strikes them as the ultimate uh, bizarre Anglo-Saxon 
uh, peculiarity. Uh, we, we come across, I mean, there's a, a classic one that we're going through at the moment is on banning um, various herbal remedies and alternative medicines of various kinds. Now, I'm sure in this room there will be a range of views about the efficacy of alternative remedies, right? Uh, as there is, I mean, it, as there is in the Hannon household, right? My wife swears by them. She thinks they're brilliant and far better than all the conventional medicine. I think that they are harmless placebos. But nobody can convince me that they are bad for you, right? Uh, and there should be a presumption of innocence in this as in anything else. You, you, you should assume other things being equal that the herbalist doesn't want to poison her customers. It's not a particularly good business model. <laughs> so anyway, I took this cause up, as I say, not, not because I'm a great uh, believer in alternative medicine, but partly because Mrs. H is. And uh, as King Solomon says, it is better to have a dish of bitter herbs in a house where there is love than a stalled ox and hatred therewith. And um, <laughs> perhaps never has the part about the bitter herbs applied quite so literally uh, as, as in this case. But again, what, you know, what, was the, uh, what was the reason for it? Again, all of my European colleagues would say, but, but you know, these things are being sold as medicines. They need to be regulated. And I would say, well, but th th they have been self-regulating since at least the reign of Henry VIII in England why to what problem is this a solution and of course the the reality is when you have that kind of mindset it becomes open to the ambitions of vested interests who was really behind the ban on herbal remedies the the big pharmaceutical corporations who saw a wonderful opportunity to impose impossible compliance costs on their smaller rivals which they could easily assimilate themselves. Same people I, I've noticed who have suddenly lined up behind Obamacare, but that's a different, <laughs> a different story. I'd like to leave time for, for, for questions, but I just want to, to focus on the point that I began with, that we take things too easily for granted. <laughs> the unique features of US democracy the term limits, the uh, states' rights, the localism, the budget, uh, the balanced budget amendments, the dispersal of power. These didn't happen accidentally. They are a working out of, let's call it the Jeffersonian ideal that was encoded at the conception of the Republic. We can all find fault with the way they've played out in practice. Perfection is not of this world. And you know what? Even your constitution is not a perfect document, but I'll tell you something. It's a lot better than what you're doing at the moment. <laughs> so, I would remind you of Hatton Sumner's great line about the straight road running from Runnymede to Philadelphia. He went on in the same speech to say, we have no king, we are our own masters. If we, the people, fail, representative government fails. Now, doesn't that imply an obligation? Yes, you are inheritors of an extraordinary patrimony. You are heirs to perhaps the finest constitution designed by human intelligence, but that surely implies a duty of invigilation and care. You need to keep fast the freedoms that you inherited and pass them on intact. Matt's brilliant book, which I plagiarized, finishes with uh, Joseph Warren, um, medical doctor chap who sent Paul Revere out on his ride and, and his his plea to his countrymen, he said, on your decision, hang the happiness and freedom of millions yet unborn, act worthy of yourselves. Don't those words apply equally today? As we see powers shifting from the 50 states to Washington, from the elected representative to the unelected functionary, from the citizen to the state, we see a reversal of the Jeffersonian model on which the Constitution was based. We see even a reversal 
of that supremacy of the law that had its birth on the riverbank at Runnymede. That, it seems to me, is a big generational obligation for all of you as Americans. You are incredibly lucky to have inherited what you did, and you don't get to mess it up. You have to pass it on in the same condition that you inherited it from your parents. Act worthy of yourselves. Question time. So we have a microphone. Uh, if you uh, wait for it, we'll hear, and then, and then the gentleman here with his hand up. Wait. Mr. Mr. Hannah, Stuart I Roy you might. Two things. One, is there a historical figure who could be called the author of the Magna Carta, much as we have Jefferson getting the primary uh, approval for the Declaration of Independence? And the other is you might put into your thinking the fact that in this country the oath taken by politicians and military is to defend the Constitution, not the state. Yes, thank you. Uh, there isn't a single author. And in fact, most of the authors were illiterate, uh, which is why we say it was sealed rather than signed. The, the king, like most people in those days, couldn't write. Uh, he put his, his signet ring on a, uh, on a piece of wax. I think the, the authors of it created more than they knew and perhaps more than they would have had they known. Like all of these things, there is a moment in history where there is a particular quarrel and yet something bigger comes out of it than anyone envisaged at the time. And the, the key clause, which is still on our statute book, is the one that says, we, the king, we may not uh, bring people to justice other than through due process and according to the law of the land. And that was the really key phrase, the law of the land. Not the king's law, not God's law, but a law that was imminent in the population and the territory. And that, you know, the idea that uh, people sometimes say we, we've romanticized it and we've, we've made a big thing of it later and so on, Magna Carta was cited 40 times in the next two centuries in precisely the same sense that its authors intended, i.e. as a guarantee against state power. Uh, the, perhaps the greatest constitutional authority and jurist of the 20th century in Britain, Lord Denning, said it is the greatest constitutional document of all time, uh, the ultimate guarantor of individual freedom against the arbitrary authority of the despot. And I think that's a, a, a pretty good way of looking at it. Another way of putting it is, I would say it's, it's, our, it's our Torah as English-speaking peoples. It's the, it's the text that sets us apart. And at the same time, paradoxically, the text that speaks universal truths to mankind. And it, 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 has a, uh, it imposes obligations on us in that sense. Any Jewish Americans in the audience? Lucky you, you've got two. You have a religious one and a secular one. Mazel tov. Uh, but, but for the rest of us, this, this one is, is a, pretty good, uh, a pretty good guide, I think, as to, uh, as to what our role in the world is. And it worked. It, it drove your fathers and mine to carry the vision of freedom to, uh, to less happy countries. Um, I completely agree about the oath of office. And if you asked me what is the supreme recommendation for a candidate for political office in this country, I would say simply that he mean it when he take his oath of office. Everything else is implied by that. Mr. Han, uh, Greg Dolan here, Madison Fellow here at Hillsdale. And I just wanted to give you the, an opportunity on the Scottish uh, vote to maybe give us your thoughts while we have you here. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to live in a country where you can do this. I'm delighted to live in a country where people can vote freely and peacefully to belong or not belong, and there's no question about the result being respected. Uh, that is, as I understand it, not completely the case here. 
uh, when a, a state attempts to secede from the Union, people have strong views about it. But it is, it is inconceivable that a shot would have been fired in anger over the question, either way, over the question of Scottish independence. And I'm, I'm, I'm happy about that. It, it, it's, uh, it's unusual. That said, I'm glad the, the result went as it did. Um, the, the border between England and Scotland is not ethnographic or linguistic. It's, it, it came about through happenstance, not, not through uh, demographic reality. There's no obvious differences of what we would normally take as defining characteristics of nationality on the two sides of the border. It's, it's, it's not like uh, between the UK and France or, you know, we speak the same language, we abuse alcohol in the same way, we have the same problems with, you know, uh, obesity in teenage pregnancies, we sing the same songs, we watch the same TV programs, you know, we, we follow the same sports, shop at the same stores. So where did the desire for a breakaway come from, it basically came from an element of the far left in Scotland who have become very dominant there for reasons which require a whole separate uh, lecture, who were saying, if you vote for us, there'll never be another Conservative government. Well, in the short term, at least that would have been true. But is that really the way you want to launch a new country? You know, the, 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 the defining ethic of the new country is that it's going to spend more and borrow more and tax more. I'm not sure that that would have been a, a, a great success. So I'm, I'm happy, uh, 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 you know, as somebody who is mainly ethnically Scottish, I'm very happy that Scotland has decided to reaffirm its place in the Anglosphere and in the United Kingdom. The EU referendum is very close. We uh, could have a vote as early as two years from now. And the polls are finely balanced. The Scottish independence campaign moved from 20 points behind to 10 points behind during the campaign. We are starting from level pegging. So I think it is a, a winnable one. And in that one, I will be strongly campaigning to take Britain out of the European Union and to rejoin the wider family of free English-speaking democracies who have been our truest friends down the ages. The European Union has left us poorer, less democratic, and less free. And I guarantee if any of you in this room were living in the European Union, you would be Eurosceptics. Uh, in fact, you would realize what a limited and minor problem you have with excessive central government here uh, if you had to spend a couple of days uh, where I work. I see the great John Fontaine nodding along, who is one of the Americans who totally gets uh, what is so awful about uh, the EU project. If I can make a, a slightly cheeky plea, it may well be the case when the referendum comes that people come asking US politicians uh, for, as, they, as Obama has, has done, uh, for defenses of the status quo. Okay, the, the current president was very happy to say you shouldn't leave unless there's a bigger problem, okay? Frankly, that doesn't matter so much, but if a Republican president were to say the same thing, I think it would be a real blow to the no campaign because people would say to us, look, even your friends, even the people that you're closest to, the ones that you look up, even they have told us to stay where we are. So any of you uh, who have any influence with the wider conservative movement, and I can see a few people in the audience who do, uh, it would be very helpful if when the time comes you were simply to say, in or outside the EU, we'll have a, a, a good, strong, friendly relationship and alliance with the United Kingdom. That's all we need. You know, all we need is your, your neutrality. Leave the rest to us. Should I go first? Yes, sir. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Um, what is the relationship between the Magna Carta and Holy Scriptures or natural law? Well, the, it, it, I mean, of course, it's signed by bishops and it begins with an imprecation of the deity as, uh, as all documents in that time did. But what I think is, is hugely significant is the idea that you've moved the legal system into the secular field. You've, you've got the concept that the law is a folk right that it belongs to the people, that it isn't interpreted by an episcopacy or by an imam or by a, a, a religious authority. In other words, uh, you've moved away from what could have otherwise been an arbitrary interpretation, which I think is, is hugely significant. Now, I suspect that almost all of the signatories, just given the 
time it was signed would have been Christians. Uh, and, you know, it at least would have called themselves Christians. They would have no doubt been imperfect. In fact, some of them were very imperfect Christians, not least King John, who was a d terrible human being. Um, but, but the significance, which I think is hugely important now, when we look at competing claims of religious and secular law in less happy parts of the world than now, the idea that you could be a, a devout and observant believer and yet believe in a separate legal system that was non-ecclesiastical, I think is a, a vital foundation of a free society. Carl Galvin. Uh, truth is beauty, beauty is truth. The Constitution recognizes gold and silver coin as money, as did the Bretton Woods Agreement. Do you foresee that a restoration of the Bretton Woods Agreement where we, we restore an honest unit of account internationally would be beneficial? And uh, secondly, regarding the Magna Carta, contemporaneous with its uh, signing, the Pope of Rome declared it null and void forever, and I don't believe has ever recanted from that position. Is that still relevant in history? <laughs> you know, uh, to be honest, it probably was. Uh, it, it accorded with the uh, patriotic pride of some Victorian historians that this had been a kind of uh, something done in defiance of, uh, uh, of the Vatican. Uh, I don't think it does anymore, no. I, th I think uh, the, the Catholic Church of today is not the medieval papacy. We've all moved on. Uh, and I think we all accept the, uh, the values of it. But on, the, on what I think is really a very, very interesting point about a commodity-based currency, um, I'm astonished by how far this argument has moved in the last five years, particularly in this country. What was an absolutely fringe position has suddenly become something that everybody at least needs to address. It hasn't yet become a mainstream view, but it's, it's no longer something that you don't discuss in polite society. And I think the reason that this has happened is not because of the persuasiveness of its advocates, although that plays a measure in it, but some of the advocates of this position uh, are not particularly persuasive. Some of them uh, show uh, aspects of behaving like a cult. I, I remember as a student, the kind of people who banged on about the gold not, uh, they, how can I put this, they, they didn't seem interested in building a broad consensus beyond the people who already agreed with them. What's really changed is the financial crisis and the response by governments to it. And that made a lot of people think, oh, hang on, maybe those guys who were banging on about Austrian economics and gold, 20, maybe they weren't, this is what they said would happen. Maybe we should take another look. And, you know, well, she do, aptly to quote uh, Keynes, the guy who has been discredited by it when he said he said when the facts change i change my mind what do you do sir <laughs> the, the, the 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 facts it seems to me changed massively with the financial crash it was clear that central banks had failed that they had kept interest rates too low for too long that they had stoked a boom that they'd encouraged malinvestment and the response when the crash came was more of the same. Cut interest rates even further, print more money. That's what's vindicated the uh, gold and silver or the commodities-based currency position. And yes, I think it will, I think it will happen sooner. The, you know the place I'm watching? Iceland. Because Iceland basically is, in a, is having a great debate about what to do with its currency. It, 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 it is the the smallest population in the world to have its own currency, if I can put it that way. It's, it's not the smallest territory on earth, but all the others are in a currency union with, with a neighbor. It's, the, it's, the, smallest, it's the, the currency backed by the smallest number of people. And it suffered very badly as a result of this when the financial crisis came. And there's now a huge debate. Should they adopt the Canadian dollar? Should they adopt the Norwegian crown? Should they adopt the pound? Should they adopt the euro? Or why not become a commodity-backed currency. And what would be rather brilliant about this is, of course, they, they don't have very much gold having uh, been through what they've just been through. They don't sit on gold mines, but the great commodity they have is fish. So we would have what they originally had in Iceland, the, the very early uh, settlers. We would have a, 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 a commodity-backed currency based on quotas of fish. It doesn't really matter what the commodity is as long as it's outside the control of the government, right? 
As long as governments can't abuse it through inflation, it doesn't matter what it is. And I think that's the, that's the fascinating one to watch. There is a, a right-of-centre coalition uh, in Iceland. They've had presentations by every kind of groups of economists, all competing. That's, the, uh, uh, that's going to be the, the, uh, the laboratory. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're, you know, we're still at, a, at at an early stage, of course, of the of the completely free currencies. And whereas five years ago, you could have said, "What are you worried about?" Right? The end of Bretton Woods has led has gone hand in hand with unprecedented prosperity for the whole world. That is a much shakier argument to make now. It's always uh, wonderful when Daniel Hannon comes through town uh, here to the States. He's a wonderful speaker and a great scholar. Uh, he also reminds us of great friendships with our English-speaking uh, relatives, a uh, friend of mine, friend of Hillsdale College. And he also reminds us what happens to countries which don't have written constitutions and become to be administered by other countries, uh, which reminds us we have things good here. <laughs> and I thank you for that. Um, you're always welcome at Hillsdale. You're here on the home campus, and I look forward to your visits. And of course, I have a, a Hillsdale tie to wear to your next location in your, in your next talk. Uh, and I thank all of you for coming today. Thank you very much.